My name is Dr. Belise Aladag, and I am a family physician at UCLA. My office is in Santa Monica uh, as part of the um, Santa Monica Bay Physicians Group. And uh, I see children and adults in a primary care setting. Um, just a reminder about Twitter, if you do come up with questions as this presentation goes along, because it is a live stream webinar, um, just go on Twitter and use the hashtag UCLAMDChat. So um, just the disclaimer, um, I have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products um, that might be mentioned in this talk or suppliers of them or any commercial supporters at all. Um, I'm going to start with a quote by Johann Goethe, a German writer of the 18th century, 18th and 19th century. Um, he said, something that I think applies to this topic, um, which requires people, I think, to be open-minded and as non-judgmental as possible um, in order to, um, to get the best results uh, with this um, disorder. And what he said was, if you treat an individual as he is, he will remain how he is. But if you treat him as if he were what he ought to be, and what he could be, he will become what he ought to be and what he could be. So uh, my passion for addiction medicine and my background in addiction, addiction medicine comes from um, just my, my interest in public health in general. Um, in addition to my medical degree and my training, my residency training, my board certification in family medicine, I. Uh, hold a master's degree from Johns Hopkins um, in public health. And during my training, I did spend time as a professional in residence at Hazelden, <coughs> sorry, Hazelden Institution um, in Minnesota, which is a world-renowned center, um, rehabilitation center for addiction to drugs and alcohol. Um, and I studied their treatment modalities um, they're famous for their Minnesota model, which is a multidisciplinary approach to addiction, including doctors, nurses, physical therapists, yoga instructors, um, tai chi instructors, meditation instructors, psychologists, um, and social workers to help treat the addicted individual. And also the um, Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step abstinence only uh, model, which they base their treatments on. Um, I later served as a medical director uh, for the Eau Claire um, Metro Treatment Center, which, is, which was a methadone maintenance center in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And of course, over there, I learned about and I dealt with maintenance therapy for addiction, for opioid addiction, which is a different approach than the abstinence only for some people. But in actuality, I believe that they can both go hand in hand and should both be used to help the individuals that are affected. So I'm familiar with both modalities of treatment and um, here at UCLA I continue to take care of opioid addicted individuals um, because I'm licensed to um, <coughs> prescribe Suboxone, uh, which I do in my clinic. And we'll discuss that later on. So addiction is an evolving concept um, the DSM listed here, DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It serves as a guide for, for example, insurance companies to decide whether or not they're going to pay for certain services. It's a, it's a uh, kind of a, a, a book of, of criteria for certain diag diagnoses. Um, so the DSM-4 um, includes physical withdrawal symptoms to be present to define something as an addiction um, or a dependence. And then DSM-5, which just came out in February, um, has, has changed this uh, definition a little bit um, and has become more inclusive. Um, they've turned away from the term dependence 
or only using the term dependence to more addiction related disorders, a more all in, um, encompassing term. Um, and again, traditionally, there's been a strong distinction between substances which cause severe withdrawal, like alcohol um, or um, opioids, uh, versus those that don't, like marijuana or nicotine, um, and even versus behavioral addictions like gambling. And now, the chemical, physical, and psychological addictions, the, the lines between them are, are blurring as we find out more and more about the science of addiction. Uh, we find that they share more in common than we thought, and they definitely share a main mechanism of action. Um, and so, as Dr. Gitlow, the president of um, American Society of Addictive Medicine, says here, it's up to us to remember that addictive illness is still addictive illness. It remains unchanged despite uh, the coming, the arrival of DSM-5 or any other diagnostic manual, uh, the disease remains the same. Um, so whether withdrawal symptoms exist or not, both substance and behavioral addictions tap into the major pathway I referred to earlier. And this is called the mesolimbic system in the brain. It um, regulates behavior via release of dopamine. Um, and dopamine is, is basically the pleasure and reward uh, chemical of the brain and um, and in addiction the the behavior persists to to obtain this feeling of pleasure and reward the behavior persists um, despite the knowledge of negative consequences um, so that's where the abnormality lies and the disorder is um, is in that pathway so there's a big question nature versus nurture um, and it's still, uh, it still remains a question, but I think it's going to be, at the end of the day, it's going to be a little bit of both. And so far, science is showing us that. Um, we know for a fact that all humans are born with systems of addiction ready to go uh, because we're wired to feel good and to pursue happiness. If something feels good, we tend to go for it. It's just the way our brain works. Um, but when addiction happens, it has to happen in a certain um, environment. Um, so opportunity is a big thing. Um, when we study early adolescents, children, et cetera, they, we find that family and social environment is extremely crucial um, indicator of whether or not the child will try any illicit substance in the first place. And um, the other thing about opportunity for example, in a study done recently, they found that states that had more internet access um, had more admissions for prescription drug use. So again, more opportunity um, to purchase things on the black market, et cetera. And then there's the, the factor of genes and genetics. Um, because once you're exposed to this substance, one person may not immediately become addicted, whereas another may. And this is most um, clearly seen in um, studies of identical twins um, done by um, different professors, but there's one specific one uh, at the um, USC uh, Research Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Center um, that, that studied twins and substance abuse and basically the twin of an addict is more likely to become an addict him or herself even though the substance used may be different. So there must be some sort of chromosomal distinction there between those people and the rest of the siblings in that same family, for example, who didn't become addicts. Um, so. Moving on, so our talk is focusing on opioids as the substance of choice. Um, they are anything derived from opiates, so morphine derivatives, morphine itself, codeine, um, and anything chemically related to these substances. Um, so most and a, a lot of the prescription painkillers fall into this category. So again, codeine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, buprenorphine, methadone, and heroin. Um, 
they're often referred to as narcotics or prescription painkillers. Um, and what they do is they stimulate a certain receptor called the mu opioid receptor in the brain. Um, so it's very easy to, to go from a person who, let's say, just had a surgery and was um, prescribed some Vicodin uh, for their pain and quickly spiral into somebody that requires that Vicodin to feel normal. And then eventually maybe um, when, let's say, your doctors cut you off, say you're asking for too much, you can't get any more, you go out and seek other ways to get that same feeling um, and you go into um, heroin, for example, or other opiates. So uh, this is very, um, very uh, prevalent, unfortunately. And why the mu receptor stimulation is so fun, I put here some, some of the um, effects it has. If you have pain, it gets rid of your pain. So you have analgesia. Sedation, so if you're anxious or stressed out, you feel sedated and relaxed. Um, there's a decrease in blood pressure that occurs as well. So again, that feeling of relaxation that may be tying into. And then finally, the feeling of euphoria. Because again, dopamine is the same chemical that's released um, uh, when you're um, satisfying your hunger for food or um, during um, sexual intercourse. I mean, it's the same powerful euphoria that, that you experience. So it starts as a voluntary choice to take a substance, but it soon becomes uh, an involuntary thing where you're, you're kind of trapped and you have the, f the feeling of compulsion and need to have the substance back in your body as soon as possible. So maybe the initial choices were bad choices, but then soon your brain chemistry changes and it compromises the way you make choices to begin with, so it just spirals and becomes a big problem. The changes that occur in the brain uh, are permanent as far as we know uh, so far. Um, and a good example of this is years down the line, a, an ex or a, an addict in remission can have cravings. And the cravings could be for the substance. And, and that could be triggered by any visual cue, a smell that reminds them of something, uh, a place that they used, or a billboard, uh, a person that they associate. Um, so this is a disease of the brain and not necessarily uh, a moral uh, downfall. Um, it does, like I said, begin as a choice, but it quickly changes. Um, and it becomes almost a need for survival. Um, and as the dependence increases, the behavior changes to become even more compulsive to the point where uh, these people are ready to sacrifice anything to feel normal again. Um, so some commonly used opioids, we mentioned some of these before. Fentanyl is another one I may not have mentioned. Um, and addiction and dependence, these are, in my talk, they're going to be interchangeable terms. Um, there's really very little difference there um, from my point of view. Um, dependence is usually a neutral term, whereas addiction tends to have, is loaded with kind of negative connotation. But regardless, the point is the same. Um, the repeated use of opioid to feel good and avoid feeling bad, and then that you continue the use of the opioid despite the negative effects on your family, on your relationships, um, your finances, your job, et cetera. You start focusing only on um, getting that feeling. And the changes in the brain that occur, I mentioned, they start changing to the point where when you're, not, when you're no longer taking the substance that you used to, you start going into what's called withdrawal, which is a, um, a very terrible feeling. It's a terrible feeling of pain, joint aches, uh, the worst flu of your life, they say, runny nose, sweating, jitteriness, anxiousness. Um, 
diarrhea, uh, goosebumps, anxiety. Um, and the, key, the thing to remember, though, is that uh, there, I don't think, have uh, been any uh, or there really aren't many deaths that occur from withdrawal from opioids. Even though it looks so dramatic and it feels so dramatic, uh, unlike alcohol, where the withdrawal could be fatal, uh, withdrawal from opioids, heroin, etc., is not fatal. It just feels that way. Um, and what you're seeing here is um, the clinical um, opiate withdrawal scale, known as COWS, that is sometimes used when we're starting people on medication for maintenance. We want to see that they're first in some sort of withdrawal state before we start them on maintenance therapy, and I'll go into that later. So this um, disease process is very prevalent, especially in our country, unfortunately, and it is deadly. Um, in 2007, nearly 100 people a day died of drug overdoses in the US. In 2008, 20 million Americans regularly used illicit substances, including opioids. Um, 20,000 deaths from prescription drug overdose occurred in 2008. And 74% of these prescription drug overdoses were from um, opioid painkillers. So hydrocodone, oxycodone, all those, um, Percocet, Vicodin, et cetera. Um, in 2009, drug deaths outnumbered traffic fatalities in the United States. So this is a health crisis, uh, and yet it's still not well understood. Um, e both by the medical community, uh, I'm sad to say, and also by the public. Um, so in any given year, almost half of the U.S. population suffers from some sort of severe addiction. Um, and yet we still have a lot of stigma around addicts, um, people that suffer from this disease, um, and even their treatment, maintenance, um, opioid maintenance treatment, for example, methadone clinics methadone in general, or Suboxone, very uh, negative um, connotations associated. So um, where does this come from? I mean, you can have a whole talk about that um, on its own, but just to briefly touch upon it, the, the addicts as a marginalized group in society, it's, it stems from a... Uh, long history of um, racially charged and, and class charged um, stereotype. And um, I'm sure it goes further back, but in America at least, we can go back to the 19th century um, and, and talk about the days when uh, the first settlers were coming, etc. Opium was associated with Chinese indentured um, servants, laborers. Um, and opium got to the Chinese from the British Empire um, who were trying to have something to exchange for the tea they were getting, et cetera. And then cocaine, for example, was associated with poor African Americans and Hispanics in America. And then later in the 20th century, we saw heroin um, become associated with poor white and immigrant groups. So this is a disease that affects the individual. It's got psychological and physical um, problems that occur. Um, the psychological ones, just a few, irritability, depression, loss of self-esteem, the sense that you're dependent on something other than yourself to survive, a chemical or your drug dealer or whatnot, can really rip apart somebody's confidence. Um, suicidal ideation is common. And suicide itself is common. Um, physiologically, because of the euphoria that occurs and the sedation that occurs in users, they are not paying as much attention to, they're not as aware as they should be of their surroundings, of what's happening, of, of measures they need to take to protect their health. So sexually transmitted diseases, bloodborne diseases, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and other STDs are, are spread very easily in those communities. And, and then 
to people that aren't users as well because again you can have sexual intercourse with people that aren't using but can then get the, these diseases as well. So it's not just an issue for this population, it's an issue for the whole society. Um, tuberculosis occurs in homeless individuals in areas where you're congregating, um, so that can happen. Endocarditis is an infection of the heart that happens in people that are injecting intravenously um, with dirty needles. Um, withdrawal sickness or abstinence syndrome, we talked about that painful feeling. And then premature death, either from um, unintentional overdose or intentional overdose, suicide uh, by some other mean, um, or one of these infectious diseases. Um, society at large is affected. Um, there's disintegration of families, of social constructs. Um, Again, I talked about the, the sexually transmitted diseases becoming more prevalent, more of a problem. Crime is increased because, again, um, people will do anything to find their, their drug. Um, there may be child abuse going on, neglect of children, um, economic losses from people not showing up to work, um, and then overall the, the increase in demand uh, for illicit substances around the world, of course, increases drug trafficking. So why treat this? Um, we already mentioned some of the <laughs> main reasons. Um, so again, to reiterate, um, the point and the goal of treatment in a medical setting is to reduce dependence on opioids and to reduce, therefore, mor morbidity and mortality related to use of these substances. Um, and to improve society, improve the functioning of individuals in their relationships, in their families, et cetera. And what are these treatment modalities? So the ul ultimate goal, obviously, is a drug-free state for most people. Um, it's, a, it's an ideal situation, um, but unfortunately, it's not a feasible one, especially not in the short term, for a lot of addicts. So there are medications that we can use um, safely to prevent these individuals from relapsing into using illicit substances and basically to help them sustain their sobriety. Um, the two most successful uh, so far are methadone and suboxone. Suboxone is made up of two components. The main active ingredient is buprenorphine and the other ingredient in it that prevents uh, abuse of it is naloxone, and we'll go into the details of that. So by staying on the maintenance therapy, the addicted individual can continue going to work, living their normal life. So how do we treat? Um, not, it's not one size fits all, um, but one thing is for sure, studies have shown that detoxification alone without anything else is not sufficient. It's not a sufficient treatment for addiction. Um, relapse following detoxification is very common. So what is advised is you start with detoxification to clear the person of the chemical substance and then you either um, go to an abstinence-oriented abstinence psychotherapy uh, counseling um, only, which again is not advised, or you combine that with maintenance therapy um, to prevent patients' cravings and withdrawal and tendency for relapse. So that is the most effective treatment system. Um, so history of methadone, um, it was a substance, it's a synthetic opioid um, uh, substance um, generate or found discovered by the Germans in World War II. It was called dolophine. Dolo is dolor, pain, and the ophine comes from morphine, so morphine-like effect. They found that they could use it in their soldiers in World War II and the wounded to get rid of their pain, um, and yet it would last much longer than morphine did. Um, in 1947. Eli Lilly Company purchased it, named it Methadone. 1964, um, 
scientists and doctors in New York City started um, using the substance to stabilize patients detoxifying from morphine, I mean, sorry, from heroin. Um, and then in 1970, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, uh, regulated methadone as a treatment for opioid addiction. And then 2001, the Drug Enforcement Agency took over that role. And just a side note here, in 2005, both methadone and buprenorphine, the active ingredient in Suboxone, were listed in the WHO, the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicines. So it's a, a methadone is synthetic, but it is a full agonist of this receptor, the mu opioid receptor that we were talking about. Um, it is FDA approved. It's tested. It's safe. It does have its problems with overdose, et cetera, and we'll go into that a little bit later. But for the most part, if it's used appropriately by properly trained physicians um, on the appropriate patients, it is safe. Um, it suppresses withdrawal symptoms, it reduces cravings, it blocks the euphoric effects of opioids for over 24 hours. That's why once daily dosing is enough um, to keep the patients stable. Um, however, there is a di major difference between um, methadone taken intravenously, if it's abused, that's how you know, they would do it, versus O, uh, methadone administered in a methadone maintenance clinic, for example, in an oral liquid form to swallow. Um, it is highly lipophilic, which means it, it likes, it attaches to, to fat quickly. So if, if it is intravenously given, then it crosses the blood-brain barrier quickly and you get that rush um, on the opioid receptors because it is a full agonist. However, if it is swallowed orally in liquid form, most of it gets taken up by the liver and about 90%. And then over the 24 hours or 36 hours, the liver slowly in a steady state releases it. So therefore, you don't get that rush, that high, but you get a steady level of um, activation of the mu opioid receptors so that you don't go into the withdrawal sickness, et cetera. So this is what a methadone clinic looks like. Uh, um, you take your morning dose, you show up at 5 or 6 a.m., and um, that's what you do. Uh, they just dispense it to you, a, a, a certified nurse, um, and usually a physician is present as well. Um, and then uh, you get on with your day. Tablets are available of methadone, and so are um, injectable ampules, but these are very easily diverted and sold on the black market and abused. So that's why in methadone clinics that are federally funded, et cetera, um, you, we, we use liquid form. So there, like I mentioned uh, before, overdose does occur, unfortunately, with methadone. And on this um, chart, this um, table from the, the CDC, you can see the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Um, in Atlanta, you can see the orange um, is methadone, deaths from methadone, versus the blue, which are a little bit higher, those are other opioids, deaths from other opioids, like oxycodone, morphine, hydromorphone, and hydrocodone. So obviously, there's more deaths from non-methadone opioids, but the methadone deaths do receive more media attention. And there could be various reasons for that, which I won't go into. But the point is that prescription drugs have accounted for most of the increase in deaths since 1999. And if you look into the deaths uh, from basically respiratory arrest or cardiac arrhythmia um, in the methadone individuals, you'll find that more than half of them had benzodiazepines in their system, like Xanax, Valium, Ativan. These are uh, CNS, or um, central nervous system um, depressors. Alcohol is another one that could be found um, in overdose situations. So um, keep in mind that this is not just methadone alone in a lot of the cases. 
So detox versus methadone, lots of studies on this. Here's some examples. Uh, when you compare the two, you find that methadone maintenance results in greater um, treatment retention than just an absence-only counseling session um, series, um, and also lower use of heroin which was in this study, the, the opioid of choice. And again, you see less HIV risk behaviors in the group taking methadone versus the non-methadone group. Again, probably because they're using less and you know, they're not um, um, sedated and euphoric. Um, so cost matters. Um, it is cost effective and efficient to, for taxpayers. So that's another you know, big hot topic as well. Okay, so it's federally funded, it's state funded, these methadone centers. Why should the average taxpayer pay for this stuff? Because it affects society as we mentioned before and it is cost effective. Um, it's about 15 to $17 a day usually is what the patients pay for their uh, methadone dosing. And um, back in 94, the California Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs um, did a pioneering large-scale study of the effectiveness, benefits, and costs of substance abuse treatment in California. And they found that the patients in the methadone maintenance showed the greatest reduction in intensity of heroin use. Um, they found that methadone was the most cost-effective treatment, yielding savings of three or four dollars per dollar spent. And regardless of the modality of care, treatment-related economic savings outweighed costs by at least four to one. So even if it's not methadone, any sort of treatment center was actually um, beneficial in that sense. Um, problem with methadone is it, due to its problems of um, overdose, um, it cannot be prescribed in your regular doctor's office in the primary care setting, for example. It has to be dispensed um, at uh, certified centers um, that specialize in addiction. Um, but there aren't enough of these centers to treat all the addicts in our society. And that's when we get into the topic of Suboxone. Um, in 2002, um, it was released. Um, and it's the first drug that is FDA approved for the treatment of opioid addiction in a physician's office. So in an outpatient setting, if a person comes to me and we decide that they are appropriate for this treatment, I can write a prescription as I could for any other antibiotic or anything. And um, they can start this treatment as an outpatient. So that's, there's an ease in that. There's, a, there's an ease in access. More people can, can utilize this kind of a service. Um, it is a partial agonist of that receptor that we're talking about, um, but it has higher binding capacity than full agonists. So what that means is if in your system you had, let's say, heroin or methadone, any full agonist of the receptors, and you took Suboxone, it would kick off the full uh, agonist and attach itself and give the partial activation, um, and therefore put that person in severe withdrawal because they were getting this full activation and now they're getting uh, partial activation. So that's why it's important to make sure that the patient is fully in a state of withdrawal before starting Suboxone. Um, even if it's mild withdrawal, any sign of withdrawal is, is any sign is required, a, a sign is required before you do that if you don't want them to go into a severe, uncomfortable withdrawal state. The thing with Suboxone is that you have better luck in patients that have been addicted for less than a year for the most part, although it has proven to be successful in other situations. Um, but generally speaking, the heavier the use, the heavier the addiction, I think between Suboxone and Methadone, probably Methadone would be more appropriate. Um, it is considered safer than Methadone, which is why it's allowed to be prescribed by doctors in the outpatient setting, because it has a ceiling on its ability to cause respiratory de depression. 
what that means is after a certain dose, you can't, it doesn't um, depress the respiratory center anymore, even if you continue to give more and more and more. So the o overdose phenomenon is, you know, n fatalities from overdose are less likely in that kind of a substance versus a full agonist like methadone, where if you do give more, you will get more respiratory depression and death. And so this is kind of pointing at that where methadone being the full agonist, the more you get, the more um, respiratory arrest and other um, symptoms. And then finally, it has its own ceiling, but it's much higher than the partial agonist suboxone here. And remember, suboxone also contains an antagonist, which I will go into, called naloxone. And there's a reason for that. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that. But basically, it's, so, it's to prevent people from abusing Suboxone and injecting it IV. Because if they do, the antagonist will take full effect and cause a severe withdrawal because it will take over the receptors, kick off anything on it, and put you in severe withdrawal. So taking it IV will, will give you that. Whereas taken orally, Naloxone um, is not... Um, put into the bloodstream easily through the digestive system, and therefore you don't have that effect. Um, so again, um, Subutex contains only buprenorphine um, versus Suboxone, which I just said contains both of those substances. Um, the reason they have Subutex is mainly uh, for induction purposes. Uh, when you're first starting somebody on um, buprenorphine, you may want to just use Subutex um, if you're monitoring them in the office setting. However, if you are going to give them a medication to take home, it's usually advisable to use Suboxone because, again, you don't want them to inject it and abuse it because it can be. Suboxone is abused. Um, and then... Finally, methadone versus Suboxone. Just going over it again. One is a full agonist uh, with high liver uptake when taken orally. So 90% is taken up and you only get that 10% activation and slowly throughout 24 hours. That's why one daily dosing is enough. And sub uh, Suboxone is a partial agonist. Um, that's why you, get the, you don't get the euphoria, et cetera. And again, one daily is enough. It lasts... Um, I believe about 36 hours max. And methadone must be dispensed from federal and state regulated clinics. You can't really do take homes until after you've proven, you know, that you're able to follow through with treatment, et cetera. And it changes depending on the clinic you go to, but after maybe, let's say, two weeks or two months, depending on the clinic, you are able to take home some doses, um, monitored doses of liquid methadone. Um, Whereas Suboxone, you can just go home that same day and take your medication on your own, in your own privacy. Uh, you need to be tapered off both of these substances because remember, one is a partial agonist, the other one's a full agonist. They both can cause addiction and in, in tolerance and dependence themselves. They are just not as likely to do those because of their properties that we just went into. So when people say, well, aren't you just substituting one drug for another, let's say heroin, you're substituting heroin with methadone, what's the difference there? Well, the difference is this is safer, it's cleaner, it's better for society, people aren't high, and there's so many reasons, which you know this talk, I think, touched upon. And then um, the criteria to start methadone versus Suboxone can differ a little bit. For starting methadone, usually you have to be at least documenting that you've been on using drugs for more than 12 months, um, whereas the criteria for Suboxone is looser. You don't have to necessarily have been using for a year. In fact, it works better if you've been using for less than a year. Um, there is an age limit that's different. And counseling is required as part of the treatment in treatment centers for methadone, whereas Suboxone is not necessarily required, but it's highly advised. When we look at treatment retention, um, Suboxone is pretty good. Um, compared to methadone, it's a little less effective in keeping people clean, but it's still 
um, at 58% retention at 17 weeks, according to the study um, printed in the um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000. Um, I think that's a pretty good rate. And then finally, to end this talk, um, I just want to touch upon um, Corey Monteith, uh, who was an actor in the musical um, series, TV series Glee. Uh, he was found dead at the age of 31, um, uh, found in his hotel room in Vancouver with uh, overdose of, of heroin and alcohol in his system. And according to reports, he's been, he was struggling with addiction since the age of 12, and he had been to abstinence-only types of rehab programs in the past and not done well. And apparently an intervention was um, was staged for him about six months prior to his death at his workplace. Um, but, and it's unclear to me whether or not he was ever told that maintenance therapy, such as methadone or suboxone, uh, was an alternative for him, an option for him, versus just detoxifying. So that's how I want to end this talk. These are some resources used in the presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now that are coming from the, the tweets, and I can answer questions um, by email as well if you come up with anything um, later on. All right, thank you. All right. So first question is, could I become addicted to opioids if I have chronic pain? And the answer is, unfortunately, yes. Uh, you can become addicted to opioids even if you don't have pain, but especially if you have chronic pain. And, so, and the reason for that is because you are an individual that's more likely to be exposed to opioids because you, you may require um, treatment for your pain, depending on how severe it is, at, some, at one point or another with a narcotic agent, an opioid such as Vicodin or Percocet. And therefore, as we mentioned before, the, the more exposure, the more opportunity, the more likely that you may become an addict um, if you happen to have the right genetic makeup or um, external circumstances like stress. Um, they found that higher stress individuals, higher stress environments lead to more addiction. Next question, how can I get methadone treatment for opioid addiction? Um, there are many methadone clinics in Los Angeles um, and throughout the country. Um, best way to find out about them would be to go to, um, um, just go to the we websites, you know, just Google methadone clinics and I'm sure a bunch will pop up. Um, we have one here in near nearby, and I think I believe it's in Culver City, um, and it's called Matrix. It's part of the Matrix treatment group, um, um, and there's, I've heard good things about it. Um, if you need additional resources, I'm happy to help, so just email me. Um, can I become addicted to opioid painkilling drugs such as oxycodone? The answer is yes, and we saw why in this presentation. How will my doctor ensure I don't become addicted to opioid medication? So this is a, uh, a difficult question. I don't know if there is a way to ensure that you will not become addicted to opioids. The only way to ensure that would be to not take them at all. Um, but if you are taking them, especially if you're taking them on a regular basis for long periods of time, the risk of addiction is very high. And the doctor that is dispensing this medication to you should be very vigilant and um, can do things like drug uh, testing, uh, testing of your urine when, once in a while when you come in just to make sure you're not abusing other drugs, which is a big clue that you could be abusing this one. Um, other things they can do is to put rules and hold to them. For example, telling you that they are not going to refill your medication earlier than necessary. If it's a 30-day prescription, they're not going to fill it earlier because you said you lost it, et cetera, all this stuff. Things like that will help, but basically the best thing is try to get off of them. 
wean off of them with the help of the doctor. Um, what does addiction do to the brain? We talked about that. Um, it does change your brain. Uh, it, the mu opioid receptors that we talked about, after a while of chronically being activated, will start um, going down, uh, getting down-regulated, we call that. And so it does change your brain permanently to the point where when you stop using, you may not be able to feel as good as you did. You may not be able to have that um, feeling of happiness, et cetera, that you would have if you had never become an addict because you don't have as many mu opioid receptors anymore because you, they've been so stimulated and downregulated. Even years after, let's say you've recovered or you're in remission, you, you don't have those receptors come back. Um, what should I do if I have a relapse? Um, I would say the first thing to do is to reach out in your social network, talk to your friend, talk to your spouse, your family members, call your doctor. It would be great if you had a trusted family doctor, primary care doctor to just reach out to and, and get you connected to the right places. But basically talk about it because the more people know about your problem and the more people know that you have relapsed, the better chances you have of surviving and getting back on your feet. Um, what happens if someone takes Suboxone at the same time as another opioid? What happens there is that because Suboxone or buprenorphine has a higher affinity for those um, receptors, it'll stay bound to it. So when the full agonist, even though it's a, so it's a partial agonist, it's only partially activating those receptors, when the full agonist, let's say heroin or methadone or whatever, comes in, it can't knock the Suboxone off. So basically the effects that you normally would expect from a rush you would get, you will not get. It blocks the effects of that um, narcotic. How long does it take for the buprenorphine only medication to work? Um, usually 20 minutes, 20 minutes to half an hour is when it should start taking effect. It depends on the person's um, chemistry and biology, physiology. Um, is continued drug use voluntary behavior? Um, my answer to that would be no. Continued drug use is not voluntary most of the time. The voluntary part of it comes in the very, very beginning, before addiction begins. That's the voluntary part of it, is taking that first couple of you know, uh, substances. After that, because of the brain changes, it quickly becomes a need for survival almost, almost like uh, thirst for water or hunger for food. That's the kind of drive that these people experience. So I wouldn't really call that voluntary. How does opioid dependence compare with other chronic illnesses? I would say it shares a lot with other chronic illnesses because of the relapsing that may occur throughout the lifetime. Even though you may be clean for a long time, you can relapse due to stressors in your life, et cetera, different things that happen, things that trigger the cravings. But the difference, I guess, would be that you can usually get better you can, you can find a way to survive and to function as a normal, as you were at baseline before becoming an addict. You, can, you have ways and treatments available to you to function as if nothing else was, nothing was wrong versus other illnesses um, where you may not have that opportunity, like diabetes that's further down, you know, advanced diabetes, et cetera. You may not have that option once you lose your sensation in your feet, you lose it once you, you know, there's, there's not as much of a uh, opportunity there. Whereas with addiction, I think you do, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, what if I know other people who've used opioids, some of them for a long time, and they never had the same problems I had? Again, that falls into the brain chemistry part of it and the genetics of addiction. They may have different chromosomal uh, makeup than you do and you may be more prone to addiction. 
which biological factors increase risk of dependence. Um, that would be a certain chromosome. Um, they have actually found that chromosome. There was a, a the research study I mentioned earlier um, at USC. I believe I can find that in here. There is a I can just email it to you once I find it. But there are there are slowly um, studies showing that there are certain um, um, chromosomal differences in certain areas that that are linked with um, with addiction or more propensity for that. Um, and then. Does return to drug use or relapse mean that treatment has failed? No, it's, it's just part of this chronic illness. Relapse is a part of the illness. It will happen due to external factors, and it doesn't mean that treatment has failed. It just means you need to get back into a more regimented treatment plan. Um, and how long will I stay on Suboxone? That is another uh, big topic. Uh, people wonder how long Will I be stuck on, stuck on methadone or Suboxone? How long do I have to take this? Well, because this is a chronic illness, um, there's no real answer to when you're going to be. Just like you would take a blood pressure medication to control your high blood pressure, which will never really be cured for the most part in most cases. You can't really cure blood pressure, high blood pressure, or cholesterol. Sometimes you can with diet and exercise, but very rarely. So just like those chronic illnesses, you may need to be on these things indefinitely, but at least I would say one year for both methadone and Suboxone. I, would rec I think it's recommended to be on it for at least for 12 months before trying to wean off of them. And that's about it. Thank you.